Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at East Silicon with Carlos Methien, who's going to talk today about energy efficiency in AI. Carlos, obviously AI is a hot topic these days, um, but there's a lot of work going on both to improve the efficiency and also to improve the performance of these chips that go into AI systems. What's going on? What's the problem? How do we get ahead of this curve here? Very good question. And actually, I, I think the answer lies in the energy efficiency. Uh, we have reached a point in which the limiting factor to build AI systems is not the performance per se, but the power that it's going to take to, to get that performance. Hence, energy efficiency is like the, the, gold, the, 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 the holy grail of AI systems these days. Is this just for the training side, or is it on the inferencing side? No, th that is pretty much across the board, both for inference as well as, as training. Training is obviously more, even more data intensive than uh, inference, but it's subject to the same constraints, pretty much. One of the problems that a lot of people have been talking about when they get into AI systems is the algorithms are changing so fast that it's hard to commit to something like a much more efficient architecture, which is fixed in hardware as opposed to software. That, that is very true. And actually, um, most people will agree that ASICs are indeed the most energy efficient uh, implementation of neural networks. However, precisely because of the reason that you just gave, it has been hard to, to bring people on to the ASIC side of things. Uh, so, but that is a trend that is changing with, with some recent developments in the area. Why don't you draw some of this out for us? Sure. What are we looking at here? So, so this is a very simple representation of a neural network. Um, and it will serve to explain where the energy is consumed uh, in this kind of system, okay? So obviously it all starts with your data input. That is the, say, for example, the image that you want to classify and detect if there is a cat in it or not. And then the way these networks are built is you have layers in your network that will do a processing of that image that is coming in. And at every layer, you will, you will perform different mathematical operations. Now, if you look at this carefully, every connection between one neuron and the next, which is typically called a synapse, um, has a weight on it, meaning you will give a different importance, a relative importance to this information traversing from neuron one to neuron two uh, with respect to the others on the same layer. Okay, so we have here a first element the weights in the synapses, the relative importance of that information. Now, once the information from more than one neuron reaches the next uh, layer, this neuron will uh, perform some mathematical function on it. Typically, the basic mathematical function is the multiplication and accumulation. So basically, you will multiply the weight by the information being transported and then add a certain factor. Very simple mathematical operation is an addition and a multiplication, very simple. That's the beauty of artificial intelligence. It's a very simple system. But you're going to do this many, many, many times. And uh, occasionally, you will also perform other mathematical functions, more complex, typically nonlinear functions. This is what we call activations. One response to this in order to improve the efficiency and also the performance has been to make the results not as accurate. That's not where you're going with this, right? You're trying to make the, what you have with the maximum accuracy and the maximum speed. Correct, correct. So what we're trying to, to uh, detect here is which operations, which functions are performed in this network, and then we will try to see where the energy is going. And that is true no matter which precision you are using for your data. Let's dig into this a little bit. How does this work? OK, so we have seen how the information traverses the network and is accumulated and operated on, on every neuron. So if you think about it, we have kind of three main operations here going on. One operation is the transport of the information, so the data movement. Then, another important operation here is the mathematical operation that we are performing on the data, so the computation, okay?
But what we have not highlighted yet is that this information that is being transported across the network needs to be stored somewhere. It cannot simply float in the air. So typically next to these neurons, you will have memory to store the information. So then the third element here is going to be the memory or the storage. And those three are the three fundamental elements where the energy is going to go. Typically, one of the ways that you really lose efficiency and also performance is by moving a lot of data over a long distance, right? Absolutely. And in fact, I would like to show you how different architectures are going to affect precisely the data movement that you're talking about. So what's the ideal architecture for this? Well, if I knew that, I would probably be rich uh, today, but I can at least tell you what not the ideal architecture looks like. If you look at this uh, diagram here, it kind of represents the fact that we have a memory where the data and the weights that we described before is stored. And we have a series of processing elements, those neurons that were doing the mathematical functions that we talked about before. Now, the question becomes, how does the data travel from the memory to the processing elements? And you can do it in different ways. One way would be, well, Let's build a connection from the memory to the processing element individually. Well, if you do this, as you can see, data has to traverse a very long distance, the more so the farther away the neuron is, and you're going to burn a lot of power in these individual connections, and you are replicating the connections for every neuron. This is very inefficient. So how do you get around that? Well, an alternative would be to have an architecture in which data is transported from the memory to the first neuron or processing element, and then subsequently passed along to the next neuron. And in this way, you are saving a lot of power already without really doing anything fancy here. This has been, if, if you go back to early computing, this was fairly simple in terms of how they did a von Neumann architecture, right? It went from directly from the processor but to memory and back again. As we got into SOCs, this got a lot more complicated. What are you proposing here that's different? Well, the thing here is, this is one of the cornerstones of what many startups in, in, uh, in this space are doing. They are coming up with non-von Neumann architectures that uh, will, uh, will allow to do a very efficient data movement. Okay, so data movement is one of the key things in AI in terms of energy efficiency. Where else can you improve energy efficiency? So along the same lines of minimizing data movement, uh, if you think about what one of these processing elements is doing, it's pretty much, if you think about it, it has your mathematical computation here, whatever it is. And then we said you need some space to store the data, so some memory, and you may, uh, and you need some way to bring the data in and the data out. So, it becomes quite intuitive to see that the tighter you can couple the computation operation with the memory where it is stored, and the, mo the, the least work you, you need to do to take the data out of the memory in such a way that it can easily be processed, that is going to give you a huge bonus in terms of energy efficiency. Above and beyond, how do you bring it in and how do you take it out? So really nothing new here other than you've taken what is a classic fundamental um, building block of computing and you've put it into a matrix, right? That is correct with one caveat. And that would be that while that is true, uh, the kind of interaction between these mathematical functions and the memories where the data is stored is such that classical memory architectures cannot provide the data in the form that it is needed. And that has um, spawned uh, a resurgence of interest in what is called near memory computing, which basically means how do we build memories and processing elements that are really intertwined. What else do you have to consider here? Well, while this is true in general terms, 
you also need to consider which kind of neural network are you processing. And actually, the differences can be staggering. If you look at convolutional neural networks, maybe the star of current industry, uh, it is built in such a way that for every mathematical operation, sorry, for every weight that you bring into the network, you will perform around thousands of mathematical operations on that same data and that same weight. Okay? So obviously here, as you can see, you bring data once, you store it once, but then you compute thousands of times. Hence, logical conclusion, you need to optimize the computational part of it to the utmost degree. Now, if you look at a different kind of network, like for example, the uh, uh, long short-term memory kind of network, which is more adequate for speech recognition, for example, you will see that for every weight, you pretty much have one mathematical operation. What does it mean? It means that there is a lot more bringing in and sending out weights and data. So hence, you need to optimize the memory itself, the access to the memory, and the data movement. So assuming we do all these things that you're talking about here, how much efficiency, how much performance can we get out of this? Again, this is not going to help us with performance per se. Uh, it's going to help us with the energy efficiency, the, the price we have to pay to get that performance, really. If you look at the evolution of the generations of architectures and, and hardware for, um, for uh, artificial intelligence systems, in, in the beginning, there was only the CPU. So CPU is kind of our uh, standard. And we went into the GPU because it had an architecture that was very much uh, more adequate you know, matrix uh, style, deep pipelining, and it presented hu huge advantages. And here we already have an order of magnitude, if not more, uh, increase in both performance as well as energy efficiency. Now, the next step was to say, well, yes, this is nice, but still not the right uh, architecture for neural networks. So. Uh, the age of the TPU came along and all of the new hardware specifically for processing neural networks. And here again, we have orders of magnitude of advantages versus uh, the GPU. So we're talking about several orders of magnitude here. Standard memory, different kinds of memory? Um, as we said, how do you store the memory and how do you couple the, the data with the computation is key. So there is a vast space here to improve the memory architectures proper, which is one of the things that many people, including ourselves, are looking into. So where are we on the curve of this is now a mature enough technology, we're going to start seeing some benefits in terms of performance, in terms of energy? Well, the, uh, the advantages are there. Uh, and you can see, you know, the three generations of Google TPUs, for example, they have stirred a lot of attention precisely because of the advantages that they are bringing over previous uh, generations of hardware. Now, uh, if you look at uh, where all of the activity is, you have a lot of activity in developing new architectures, as we said, but also there is a huge amount of activity around developing new IP that will bring together the data transport, the data storage, and the computation. And that's the holy grail. Carlos Mathayen, thank you for a very interesting explanation. My pleasure.